Happy Sabbath. Are you happy? Are you sure? Then smile. It's intimidating to get up here and everybody's... So, we are ecstatic to be here back home. And uh, we are wanting to share with you uh, what God has done, is doing, and uh, we're just super excited to be here. And we want to say another word of prayer, and I want to give you an opportunity uh, to pray for yourself, to pray for yourself that you would hear exactly what you need to hear, not from me, but from the Word of God and the Spirit of God working, moving, speaking to your heart. Amen? So I'm going to give you a minute. And you pray, and then I'll pray. Amen. Father in heaven. Lord, it is just such a precious privilege to be able to call you Father. Oh, Lord, it is your time, Lord. We're asking you to do for us that which we cannot do for ourselves. We come to you in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. So our uh, Bible study this morning is called Inheritance. <clears throat> and 1 Peter chapter 1, verse uh, four and five are the texts that we really want to focus on. It says, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away, reserved where? In heaven for who? For everybody else. What does the Bible say? There is an inheritance reserved in heaven for me. So did you know that you have an inheritance? Amen, Pastor. Did you know that you had an inheritance? Amen. Does that excite you? All right, well, let's keep going. So when you think of an inheritance, what do people usually think about? Material, right? You're going to inherit the estate, or you're going to inherit the whatever it is. And so usually people think of inheritance. Now, what are some other things that are not material that people inherit? You can talk. Genes. Oh, that's, that's a powerful one. We've all inherited hereditary, right, tendencies that were passed down from what? Generation and generation and generation. What are, some other, what, what are some of these tendencies that are passed down that we inherit? Let's start with the positives. Well, let's start with the negatives. We'll end with the positive. All right. <laughs> so what are some negative things that we have inherited? Sinful nature. Okay. Anybody else? That kind of encompasses everything, right? <laughs> but, but any specifics that we have inherited? Because of sin. Our looks. Our good looks, amen? Yes. You inherited diseases, right? What else do we inherit? Our temperaments, right? Okay. What else do we inherit? Your mother's Bible. What did you say? Selflessness. Oh, selfishness. Okay. Anybody else? What are some things that we inherit? appetites. What about your culture, right? Your skin tone, your eyes, your, all of these things are an inheritance, okay? So let's go to our Bible. Let's see what is the Bible saying about our inheritance. We're going to Matthew 19, verse 29. Matthew chapter 19, verse 29. What is it that we inherit? When you say, when you get there, please say amen. Matthew 19, verse 29, and it says, And everyone that hath forsaken what? Houses, brethren, 
or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or what's that other word? Lands for what? My name's sake shall receive a hundredfold and what else do they get? So they, it's missing up here, they what? Inherit everlasting life. Now notice there's an exchange here. Everything that was in the first slide, the material things, is being exchanged. So houses, anybody got a house? Anybody ever, ever had to give up a house? Right? Uh, uh, brethren, have you lost some family members because of your faith? Or what about sisters or fathers or mother, or children, even land? And what does he say? For my name's sake, right? He says they shall inherit. Okay, let's go. So the first thing we learn about inheritance that we e inherit what? Everlasting life. Anybody excited about that? Okay, but you already knew that. Let's go to Matthew 25, verse 34. It says... I'll give you time to turn there. It says, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit what? The kingdom. So not only do we inherit what? Everlasting life, but everlasting life is spent where? In the kingdom prepared for who? It says you. It's prepared for me. Did you know that? There's a kingdom that's prepared specifically for me. And when was it prepared? From the foundations of the world. Okay, what else do we inherit? So we inherit the kingdom, amen? Okay, so let's keep going. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. Okay, so we inherit the earth. Do you want the earth right now? You wouldn't want the, the earth the way it is right now? Are you sure? Come on, all the oil and gold and all the diamonds and come on, who cares about the sin and the sinners, but you get all the material wealth. So what else do we inherit? Revelation chapter 21 verse 7 says, He that overcometh shall inherit, anybody know how it ends? Or inherit what? All things. So what is the Bible telling us right now? What, what do we have right now as far as the biblical picture of inheritance? We have everlasting life, which takes place in a kingdom. That kingdom will eventually be here on earth. And guess what? He says, I'm going to give those who overcome everything. Can you smile? If you don't want to say amen, just smile. Just say, okay. So he says, and I will be his, wait, he's going to be your what? And he shall be my, or daughter, amen? Wow. Okay. So we inherit all things. So Christ came to secure your what? Let's say that together. Christ came to secure my inheritance. Okay. So he is heir to the throne. Amen? He is called everlasting father, right? He's called prince of peace, mighty God. It says that the key of David is, is on his shoulder. It says the government is on his shoulder. He is king of kings and lord of lords. So he's heir to the throne. So the Bible speaks much about the importance of having an heir. So in the Jewish culture, started with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? To have an heir was critical to the inheritance, the promises. Let's go to Genesis chapter 15. Where are we going? Genesis chapter 15. See, Abraham, Abraham had a problem. What was his problem? We're going to see Genesis chapter 15. We're going to read verses 1 through 4 and 7. Here we go. Are you ready? Are you ready? All right. So it says, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a 
saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy... Okay, so the first thing that God tells Abram is that he is a what? A shield. What, what do you need a shield for? For protection, okay? So, hey, Abram, I know you've left mother. I know you've met father. You've met your, you left everything for me. And guess what? Because you have trusted in me, I am going to be your shield, okay? So what is the armor of God? You know this. It's the what? We have the, what's the first one? Jesus putting on the helmet of salvation. You have the sword of the spirit. You have the, the belt of your feet shod with the and the shield of faith. So the Bible says in Habakkuk, the just shall live by his faith. That's what it says in Habakkuk. It's his faith. Whose faith? God's. Okay, so your shield and your buckler. You've read that before? He's our shield. He's our buckler. He's our strong tower. And so when we take the armor of God, what's armor for? What's armor for? So you, you just walk around with armor on your way to, to work? Ching, ching, ching. What is armor for? You only wear armor if you are actively involved in warfare. Otherwise, you don't need it. How's your armor? Sometimes it gets a little bit dusty, huh? <laughs> Sometimes we got to shine it and polish it up so that it looks like we're actually using it. But if you don't lose it, what happens? Remember when uh, they stole the gold shields? Remember that? What did he do? <laughs> he took some cheap imitations because he still wanted the, the, the external visible, the acts, it, it's still there. They're, they still shine, don't they? They still look good, don't they? But were they gold? The Bible says that your faith is like what? Bronze tried in the fire. Is that what it says? Oh, it's gold. Okay. All right, we're going somewhere. Okay. So he's your what? Peace. Okay. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1, we're still, 15, verse 1. It says, after these things, he says that he will be your shield and your what? Exceeding. What? That word exceeding. Above and beyond all you could what? Think, dream, or imagine. Eye has not seen. Ear has not heard. It has not entered into the mind. Can anybody finish it? Ooh, he, he got it. Notice, for them that do what? Love him. Okay, we're going somewhere. So he says that there is an exceeding, abundant, eternal, everlasting, I can't think of any more adjectives, life waiting for those who, now, okay, I, I meant to ask you. I already gave you the answer. Why do you want to go to heaven? <laughs> I mean, you don't want the streets of gold? You don't want the white robes and the crown? And what, what is heaven? Jesus, right? Heaven is to be in the presence of your Savior, your Lord, the lover of your soul. Okay, so... When we get to heaven, <laughs> what are we going to do with all the, all the material things? We're going to do what? We're going to cast the crowns at his feet and say, holy, 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 worthy is the lamb. Have you, have you read Revelation 4 and 5 recently? Have, have you experienced? Is that how our worship is? Well, wait, I didn't ask that. Is that how our worship is? When we come in the presence of God, is there ex is, are you excited to come into Jesus' presence? Or are you just nadab in a bayou? 
offering what? Strange fire. You know, it's strange in heaven not to praise. It's strange in heaven not to worship, not to love God with all your heart, all your soul, all your... That is strange. It's foreign to heaven. Let's keep going. Verse 2, he says, And Abram said, Lord God, what will thou give me? Now, what did he say he was going to give him? <laughs> he just told him what he was going to give him. What did he just say? I'm going to be your shield, and I'm going to, what? You're going to have a what? Exceeding great reward. Then Abram turns around and says, by the way, Lord, what are you going to give me? And notice, he says, seeing I go, what was Abram's problem? No children. He says, and the steward of my house is this Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, behold, to me thou hast given me what? No seed. So what, did, what was he lacking? An, an heir. Right? He needed someone to inherit all of the precious promise. He says, I don't have an heir, Lord. And Eleazar, he's not even mine. So he had been promised what? The promised land. And he says, I'm not going to live forever, Lord. Who's going to what? Inherit this. So he had no heir to the promise. Verse 3, it says, And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, Thou, this shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. Verse 7, he said unto him, I am the Lord that, that brought thee out of Ur the Chaldeans to give thee this land for what? To inherit. So what does God promise? Anyone and everyone that accepts the call out of Ur of the Chaldeans. Babylon is promised what? An inheritance. What are you promised? An inheritance. Land. What, what, what are you promised? Land. Okay, we're going somewhere with it. So how does this work? How do, does this work? So there must be a will in order to have an inheritance, correct? Has anybody ever inherited something? right? Usually when a parent or a grandparent or somebody passes away, right? So the, there must be a will. And so usually we say there's a, a last will and testament. What is a last will and testament? So the person, prior to their death, they write down what they want or how they want their resources, their land, their Bible, whatever it is, allocated to their, what's that word? Heirs, okay? All right, so did Jesus have a will and testament? Pop quiz. Did Jesus have a will and testament? Does God have a will and testament? Yes, you're saying yes. Because he has to have one, right? So let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. Where are we going? Ephesians chapter 1. So we have to understand how we actually inherit, okay? Ephesians chapter 1, starting with verse 11. Everybody there? It says... In whom also we have obtained what? An inheritance being what? Predestined according to the purpose of him who worketh all things according to the counsel of his will. Does God have a will? <laughs> Did he have a will before the foundations of the earth? Did he have it? Did was the plan of salvation an afterthought? No, okay, amen. So notice, let's go to these texts just to, to, to in, in the mouth of two or three witnesses. Let's go to 1 Timothy. Where are we going? Are you following? We're going somewhere with this. This, this is, we're in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. It says, 
who will have all men, wait, who, who, who wants all men to be saved? So what's his will? That all men shall be saved and come unto the knowledge of the what? Wait, wait, what, what is God, what is his will? For every man, woman, boy, and girl on planet earth, to be in a saving relationship with Jesus through the knowledge of the truth. That's his will. All right, let's go now to 2 Peter. Where are we going? 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. And we're looking at verse 9 through 14. When you have it, please say amen. It says... The Lord is not slack concerning his what? Has he made promises? It says, as some men count slackness, but is what? Long-suffering unto usward, not willing that any should perish, but that some should come to repentance. Is that what your Bible says? That the Christian should, is that what it says? That the Baptist or the, the, the non-denomination, that the Christian world comes to repentance. What does it say? I mean, what does all mean? Does all, all doesn't really mean all, does it? He says that all should come to what? But the day of the Lord will come as what? A thief in the night in which the heavens shall pass away with great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat and the earth also and the works uh, that are therein shall be what? Wait, I thought we was going to inherit the earth. Why, why are you going to burn it up? Like Saddam Hussein, remember what he did? He was like, if I can't have it, he just burned all the oil fields. Is that what God's doing? No, let's keep going. Verse 11, seeing then, that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we be in all what? Holy conversation and godliness, looking, what are we doing? Looking for, and what's that word? Wait, wait, wait. So not only are we looking for it, God says we should be hastening. What does hastening mean? We should what? Make it come about what? Faster. Now, this is, this is interesting. Remember the prodigal son? He wanted to hasten his inheritance. <laughs> Y'all don't get it. Did you, did you get it? He wanted to hasten the coming, not of the Lord, but the coming of his inheritance. He was like, Dad. Matter of fact, he couldn't even wait. He was like, Dad, just go and give it to me now. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that what? So there's a hastening that's bad, but there's a hastening that's also good. We should be actively involved in hastening the coming of the Lord. If he says, when you see all these things, you know that the earth is going to be destroyed, and you know you have neighbors that don't know Jesus. And you say, howdy, neighbor. You know people that are not in a saving relationship. They have no knowledge of the truth that you have, and you say absolutely nothing. Let's finish it up. It says, and hastening unto the coming of the day of the Lord, wherein the heavens being what? On fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with what? Fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for what? Oh, there's the good news. <laughs> so he's going to burn this world up, and then he's going to create what? New heavens and new earth, wherein dwells, what's that word? Righteousness. Okay. So, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ. You see, yes, God worked out all things according to his will. His will, he says, oh, uh, Hebrews chapter 9. So let's look at this, this, this testament. What's another word for testament? It's his will. 
right? Will and testament. So we're going to Hebrews chapter 9. Where are we going? Hebrews chapter 9. And for this cause, he is the what? Mediator of the new testament. Okay? So it says that Jesus is the what? mediator. Now, a mediator is one who intervenes between two either in order to make or to restore peace and friendship or form a compact or to, what's that word? Ratify a covenant. Okay, so how is a will ratified? When does the will go into action? After the person dies. Right? So notice, by means, by, by, that by means of what? So did Jesus die? So when he died, what was he actually doing? He was ratifying, come on, Miss Tony, he was ratifying, right, his will and his testament and what is his will that none should perish but that everyone should come to the knowledge of God that is your father's will notice he says for the redemption of the what transgressions that were under the he says Jesus came so by his death, Christ ratifies the will for some sinners. Is that what it says? All sinners that were under the death sentence, all have sinned and all have fallen what? The wages of sin is death for who? So are, are we under a death sentence as human beings? Okay. So they which are called may receive the promise of what? Eternal inherit. There's an internal inheritance. So Jesus is the administrator, right? He's the one who put the will together. He's the one who died. Now, after the person dies, who takes over? The executor. <laughs> All right. So what is the executor? The person who minutes it. So they carry out the terms of the will. So whatever is written there, do they have power? Yes. But who gave them that power? The one who died. I hope you're following me. <laughs> okay. So notice, the executor, let's look at these. They develop a list of any beneficiaries of the estate and contact those individuals. So what they have to do, they have to figure out, okay, John and Bob and Jamal and Susie and, right, Moesha. So, so I have to now go out as the executor and I have to find those whose names is written in the will. Number two, I mean, this is including tracking them down, beneficiaries who may be what? Difficult to find, right? They moved 10 times, they've been to jail, they, you know, whatever. They, they married five times and, you know, they changed their name six times. Okay, number two, help any beneficiaries to understand what? The last will and testament, they have to explain the plan of action. Okay, so have you ever, guys, if you're old enough to remember this TV show called The Millionaire, you guys remember that? All right, The Millionaire, for those of you who don't know, there was this old TV show, and this gentleman right here, he worked for a multi, multi, multi millionaire, and every month he would give a check, a cashier's check of a million dollars to someone who he searched out. And he was doing a, an experiment to see how this inheritance unexpectedly would change their lives. People thought he was crazy. And so this gentleman right here is the executor. What is he? So he would say, hey, I saw, this is the name for this month, and he would give him the check, and this man, he would go, and he would knock on the door, and he'd say, excuse me, are you Bobby Jones? And he'd be like, yes, who are you? 
well, you don't know me, but can I talk with you? I have something for you. And he'd invite them in, and he would tell them that you, if you had a million dollars, <laughs> right, what would you do? I'm asking you. If you had a million dollars, what would you do, Miss Tony, right now? You'd invest it, okay? All right. I, I, I'm, I'm tempted to ask you what, but I'm not. Anybody else? If you had a, my brother, what's your name? Matt, what would you do if you had a million dollars right here, tax-free, no, no strings attached, what would you do? Charity, okay, anybody else? Miss Jen, what would you do? Million dollars right now. Pay off my student loan, amen, amen. <laughs> so, so, so he would show them this check and people would respond differently. What, what, was, what, what does she look like? She about to pass out. She's shocked, right? Then you would have other people, he, he would look, how does he look? Confused, suspicious, right? And so guess what? After he found out it was real, he was like, yay! My whole life is transformed in just one moment. And some people would be in disbelief. They'd be very skeptical. Some of them would be worried, like, man, can I even handle this amount of money? <laughs> Are you for real? <laughs> right? And so the executor, he only had two things. He had to what? Deliver the message and have them sign the agreement. That's all they had to do. Just deliver the message and help them do what? Sign the agreement. So who did Christ leave to execute his will on earth while he administrated in heaven? Uh-oh, we coming home now. <laughs> so who are the executors of God's will on planet earth? Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. Mark chapter 16, verse 15. What is Jesus waiting for? I mean, it's been 2,000 plus years. Come on, what is he waiting for? Didn't he, doesn't he see the pandemic? Doesn't he see people are dying and, 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 and sin is just running rampant? What in the world is he waiting for? Matthew chapter what? Mark chapter 16 verse 15 says, And he said unto them, Go ye into some of the world and just teach whoever you feel like it, whenever you feel like it, and if you don't want to do it, you ain't got to do it. Is that what your Bible says? That's the LLC translation. <laughs> Right? My Bible says, go ye into all the world and preach, proclaim, publish the gospel to what? Every creature. Wait, wait. So who is he talking to? He's talking to his disciples. So who are the executors? Are you a disciple of Jesus? Whoa, whoa, whoa. I want you to think about it. Are you an executor? How many souls have you found out to let them know that they have an inheritance? I'm not talking about last year, last month. I'm talking about in your daily life, are you seeking out people who don't know that they have an inheritance? You know, every person we come in contact with is a what? A candidate for salvation. <laughs> right? They're a beneficiary. So, Acts of the Apostles says, Before ascending to heaven, Christ gave his disciples, gave his disciples their what? Now, notice how the spirit of prophecy backs up what the Bible says 100%. Amen, Pastor. Notice it says, He told them that they were to be the what? Wait, wait, what's that word? 
executors of the will in which he bequeathed to them the world, what? The treasures of what? Woo! Mercy. To, to the world? So you mean we have been commissioned, commanded to go and tell people that they have an inheritance in the kingdom of righteousness. Wow. Notice. So we're to talk to, communicate. All we have to do is present the message and help them to come into agreement with what? The word. So, thy word have I what? Thy word is a, the entrance of thy word gives light. Is the world getting darker and darker? Do you see it? Do you literally feel the evil? What are you doing as an executor? With your, he says, all power in heaven and earth is delivered unto me, therefore what? Was that a suggestion? Here are they. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that do what? Keep the command. What's his last commandment? Oh, wait, what's that last commandment he said? But I keep the Sabbath. I mean, I don't drink anymore. I don't smoke. You know, I, I don't commit adultery. You know, I, I, I try to love people. Was that what he said? What was the last thing he said? Go. Go. Tell somebody. Go. Tell somebody. Matthew 24, 14. We know this text. Anybody know what this says? And this of the shall be in all the, and then, wait, wait, wait. This is the only text that says the end will come when this happens. Did you know that? This is the only text that says when this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached, proclaimed, then and only then can the end of the world come. Is this a solemn message? That's how I received it, too. I had to get on my knees and say, Lord, <laughs> Lord, be merciful unto me, a sinner. Amen? Are we living in the hour of his judgment? Is he serious? So, the gospel of the kingdom <laughs> shall be proclaimed. Okay, so two weeks ago, God sent me to a spiritual retreat. And you know what we do. We, we, our whole life is ministry. Our whole life is in the service of God. Okay, so we went, I went, and I thought I was going there to do some work. And God was like, no. I went, I, I went away to a hotel for a week, right? And I was like, okay, Lord, I get there. And there's drug addicts all around and all types of just crazy people. And I'm there. And I'm sitting there and the Lord was like, okay. The first two days it was hard because I'm used to doing stuff and being busy. Anybody know about that? And so after two days, the Lord was like, I want you to fast for three days. So I fasted for three days and he said, I want you. How many of you guys have read that quote? A thoughtful hour a day, <laughs> right? We know that quote, right? How many of us actually do it? <laughs> Don't raise your hand. And so I began to dwell on Gethsemane, first day. Then I went to Pilate and the, and, the, and the farce of a trial. And then on the third day was the trial. And, 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 then on, and, and God showed me, London, you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. All of your righteousness is filthy, disgusting, vomiting to me. You have 
lost your first love. Is that what the Bible says? Are you sure? What was Ephesus' problem? Did they lose their first love? Go to Revelation. See, we misquote that text. It does not say that they lost it. It actually says they left their first love. What's the difference? Losing and leaving. <laughs> and leaving. One's voluntary. One. So the Bible says that Ephesus had left its first love. And God confronted me and says, why do you do what you do? <laughs> like, why are you on the road? Like, why are you passing? Why do you do what you do? Is it because of duty or is it motivated by love for me? And I had to confess, I'm sorry, Lord. And that literally radicalized my whole spiritual experience. This is just a couple weeks ago. And this was a part of how he confronted me. And so, since then, I am on a mission to love God. I don't even know how to do that. How about you? It says we love him because, I mean, I understand it in here, but in here, in the, the depths of my soul, so since then, we've had some experiences. I want uh, Sayla to come up. So, Anthony, you can come up too. So, Sayla and Anthony, where have we been recently? Just tell them some of the places that we've been recently. Uh, <clears throat> Nebraska. Where is this? Oklahoma, Louisiana. That's Fayetteville. No. Okay, anyway. I think that's Lincoln. No, yeah, that's Lincoln. Lincoln, okay. And have you had, what, what, what experiences did you have while you were out there? I don't know. Just, just. You did. I'm putting them on the spot. It's okay. <laughs> okay, so what happened here? Where were we here? Look at this picture. Where were we here? Um, we were in Fort Smith, and we were out doing literature work, and we ran into this gentleman. Yeah, from Washita. From Washita Hills. And he was super discouraged that day, was he not? Yeah. yeah. And we were able to bless him and be an encouragement to him. Amen? Yeah. Okay, so Sayla had an opportunity this week. I want you to tell about your opportunity. Um, so, um, it was... Oh, actually, you, you go first. We'll, yeah. Okay, we'll come back to this. I forgot. It's you first. So, Anthony and I, we'll have to go back. Okay, we'll start here. So, Anthony and I, uh, our car broke down, uh, and the transmission went out. So, that means we couldn't go anywhere, right? And so, we were like, what are we going to do? They had some bikes. I was like, let's go ride our bike downtown. So, we went downtown, went on some biking trails. We were coming back, and we saw this place that kind of looked like a bar, but it had a basketball court, and there's some kids playing basketball. So I said, hey, let's go over there and play some basketball. We played some basketball, shot around, and I turned to Anthony. I said, Anthony, we have to get into the community here. And then about a minute later, yeah. what happened? A guy came out and he said that it was a youth group for a church. It was actually a church youth group. It looked like a bar, but it was actually a church youth group. And so I talked to the lady. She said, why don't you come back next week? And so we went back, was it, it was last, last week. week, and it was just powerful. It was a super powerful experience. These young people love, what did you say when we left the first time? Stand up. Um, tell, tell them what you told me. These kids are what? On fire. On fire. Yeah. Same age as them. These kids, are, they came to, to the youth group, Bible in hand, notebooks, everything. And, 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 and what do they do every Sunday morning? They pray for two hours. Before church. They pray for two hours, the young people, before church service. And so we went back, and, and so they invited us to come back, and they said, hey, next week is missions week. You guys should come. That was this week, right? So 
I've been doing online classes, and I did a three-day fast this week. And on the third day, I was like, Lord, I'm expecting monumental things. I know you're going to bless. I know you're going to do something. And we go there, and what did, they, what did what the pastor ask you to do? Um, can, can you speak about um, your mission work tomorrow? Tomorrow. <laughs> no prior notice. <clears throat> and so... What did you say? Okay. And then what did you say? Yes, just to be polite. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and so I was like, praise the Lord. And then he was like, oh, yeah, can you speak Wednesday night? There's about 150 young people that come. And so Sayla went Wednesday morning. So tell, tell them your experience. I just told a story about the guy that we met in Oregon that got baptized. No, tell them the same story. Oh. You haven't told them the story. Yes, have. They have? Yes. They want to hear it again, don't you? Okay, go ahead. So you're in Oregon, and we were at a gas station, and I was passing out flyers for a vandalistic series. And, the, and I saw this guy come out, and I said, oh, he's not going to come because he had cigarettes and beer in his hand. And I gave him the thing anyway, and he came to all the meetings and got baptized. Mm. And who else got baptized? Me. And who else? Me. So... What was the lesson you learned? Don't judge people. Is there a text that says Man something about that? Man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Mm, okay. So she shared, and how did the young people respond to you? Um, they were excited. They were excited, okay. And then the next day, Anthony, you gave your testimony. What's your testimony? It was about the time where we were in Sarasota, Florida, and the guy, he was a gay atheist, and he said that to make Jesus lovely. And what was his experience with Christians? Bad. What happened? Tell him the story. What happened? Um, he was at a coffee shop, and a guy handed him a track, and he was like, no, thank you. And the guy said that you're going to burn for, in hell forever. Mm. And so he turned to you and said what? If you want what? People like me to listen to people like you. Make Jesus lovely. Mm. He said, if you want people like me to listen to people like you, what? Make Jesus attractive. He said, we, have, we know what we have. We know what you claim to have, but it ain't pretty. It's not attractive. It's not alluring. You haven't told me that I have a kingdom to inherit. Okay, so Nikisha's going to come up and give her story. Thank you. only going to take a few minutes, but um, every time we know we're going to speak at a church, I always ask the Lord to give me something to share that happened th this week, because a lot of times we're sharing stuff that happened 10 years ago, 15 years ago, last month. We want it to be fresh, and so last week, we didn't know we were going to be speaking here, because I thought we'd be somewhere else, <laughs> but anyway, um, last week, I get a text from my mom, and she says, I'll just call her Anna, she says, Anna's sick. And we want to have a special praying for healing for her. Um, can you do a Zoom call? And my first response was no, absolutely not. And I'm going to tell you why. Um, my mom, I grew up in San Francisco, and my mom worked for this um, company, 13 Bosses, very, very successful, very affluent connections. And they would always have Christmas parties, different parties at their home. And these parties would be, you know, you have the butlers and all this type of thing. And I grew up in that environment. And when we were 13, 14 years old, you know, that was the time where the boys, they would teach them to smoke cigars, and we could drink if we wanted to. It was just that type of atmosphere. Um, I'll never forget, um, one time I was just playing around, and one of the bosses said, you want anything to drink? I said, yeah, give me brandy on the rocks. My mom was standing right there, and he gave me brandy on the rocks. And I took a sip, and I was like, oh, how can people drink this? And that was the end of my drinking career. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Praise <laughs> the Lord. But that's just the environment. So when 30-plus years passed, they saw me go into the mission field. They came to the wedding and, you know, everything. So we've been connected with that family, with, that, with all the bosses for all these years. Because my mom worked there almost 20 years. And um, when that came to me, and they said such and such was sick, I was like, that's about right. You know, and I was like, I don't want to pray for this person knowing they're living in sin, you know, because we're told about this um, through the spirit of prophecy. But that's mean. That's mm -hmm. not attractive, right? 
And so I, was, so I didn't text her. I said, well, we're going to be out of town. And the car broke down. The car's been in the time. shop the second time. So the got fixed the first time. Insurance covered everything. But because, it's an, because we've already put a hunt, Hundred almost 120,000 miles on it, they didn't give us a new transmission. They gave us a refurbished transmission. And so when they went to Nebraska and yeah, um, Louisiana, he came back. He said, the car is whistling. Something's wrong. So when he went on his spiritual retreat, the car dealership is right around the corner. He took it there. They're like, oh, the transmission's like, it just fell apart in their hands, basically. Mm. And so they're like, we have to get you another transmission. And so the car's been in the shop for two weeks. And so... My first response to my mom was, no, we were going to be gone. I can't do it. And then she was like, so it's Tuesday or Thursday. Which one can you do? And I was like, oh, Lord, I don't want to do it because I just know this environment, you know. And the Holy Spirit just spoke to me and said, no, that's not making Jesus lovely. So I said, yes, I'll do it. And I said, Lord, please give me the words to speak because Jesus is not in the business of, of creating healthy sinners. He wants to heal us, but he wants to cleanse us from sin. So how do I present this in a way that is beautiful, where it's not that I'm condescending? You know, you know, you know how we can be. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, so I prayed about it, and the Lord gave me some text. And um, I'm going to share these texts with you because you can share them with people that you come in contact with. I'm going to share you four t- with you four texts, and um, you know, it may be touching for you. And so the first text I shared, so we had the call on Tuesday. And the first text, you know, we all know it's 3 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Um, I mean, yeah, 3 John 2, two chapter, um, verse 2. Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health, even as thy soul prosper. And I, the first thing I said to and it was a call, a Zoom call, full Zoom call. And I said, you know, the first thing, I said, first, God wants us to prosper, but he, he wants us to be in health. He wants us to have amazing families, amazing lives. But he also wants to, our spiritual side to prosper. And then Psalm 103 was the next text. We can go there. And this is my favorite one. Psalm 103, verses 1 through 3. Sorry, I had a paper there and I lost it. And it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all thine iniquities, Mm. who heals all thy diseases. And as God was giving me these texts, I didn't realize that it's right there. He wants to heal us physically, and he wants to heal us spiritually. And so I I said that. I said, you know, all of us have done, if we've lived long enough, we've all done terrible things in our lives that were worthy you know, of death, but God promises to forgive us from all of our iniquities, and he promises to heal us. And I said, if you keep reading, he, said, he talks about taking our sins and casting them as far as the east is mm-hmm. to the west and not remembering them anymore. And then the third text I shared was Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 14. And it says, heal me, O Lord, mm-hmm. and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for thou art my praise. Again, so that's talking about physical healing and spiritual healing. And the lady I'm calling Anna, she was not on the call. This was for her. And so when I was praying during the week, I said, Lord, I know this is not for her. It's for these people. Because these are the ones that I've had contact with all these years, 30 plus years, you know. And so again, healing. And then James chapter 5, which we... We know, um, verse 14, 15, and 16, it says, Is any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church and let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And I said, you know, we're all here gathered praying for this one person. And I said, And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And I said, why do you think, I asked the question, why do you think physical healing and spiritual healing are connected in all these verses? And um, the answer was because God wants to first heal us spiritually so that we can trust him no matter what. Because if he chooses not to heal, we can still be at peace. The person we're praying for, she can be at peace. By the time I finished this, there was not a dry eye on the call. And um, we prayed, and then we had a season of prayer, and like 
these people, they don't go to church, but we had a season of prayer and they Amen. were confessing their sins. Amen. You know, they were asking for healing. They were asking for forgiveness. And I'm going to share with you a text message that came. Um, I took a picture of it because I knew we didn't have the internet. Um, one of the ladies, one of the bosses, former bosses, because everyone's retired, it says, good morning. We all cannot thank you enough for what you have guided us through. You Oh, I'm sorry, before I read this. And then I said, after, before I read, I said, I want to give you two resources that if you're open, you can look at them yourselves and then share them with this lady. And one of the resources was Forks Over Knives, a documentary. I don't know if you've seen that. And I told him, it was, that's one of my favorite ones, but it's older. And, I, and then I introduced him to Weimar Institute. And I told them what they do there and how we had a friend who was basically given a couple of days to live. She went there. Um, vomiting in a wheelchair and she, by day four she was jogging and she's been fine ever since and I just gave them that testimony and so and they were really really excited about that um, and so the, the text I got the next day was good morning we cannot thank you enough for what you have guided us through you are truly an angel on earth God had made you has made you his instrument you have made your mom and grandma proud they remember my grandmother um, and so and then I wrote back, good afternoon. It's always humbling. Because remember, I didn't want to do this. <laughs> I did not want to do this. It was always humbling to hear how God uses my experiences to be a blessing to others. I am overwhelmed at God's graciousness and mercy. And to know, because I wanted them to know this part, that each of us has a story and he wants to use us all and that he wants to use us all is utterly amazing. May he continue to lead and guide you and your family blessings. And so, and that just happened this week. And I had been praying, um, Lord, let me, um, let me do something for you this week. And then he gives me this. And I said, no, I don't want to do it, you know. And um, the Lord's just been working with me all week. And I just praise the Lord for this opportunity. And then my mom texted me. She said, wow, finally a door is opening. This is 30 plus years. Mm -hmm. And if you know anything about money, it's hard <laughs> to reach, you know, people with a lot of money. And so this is 30 plus years. And they've watched, they've known me since I was 12 and my sister since she was eight. And they've seen me go to the mission field. They've seen me in college, you know, and they've just been very supportive of, of me and my family. And so I just wanted to leave that with you that no matter where you are, no matter how long it takes, this is 30 plus years. Mm. I just saw them two years ago at Key West, Florida, when we were in Florida and drinking and cursing, you know, just that lifestyle. And it's like, you know, God opened up a little door mm. and now they're like, and they see them confessing their sins and saying, I want what you have. Mm. That was just so beautiful and humbling to me. And so God can use all of us. Amen, amen. So what do we have? What do you have to offer? Jesus. Amen? Jesus. Notice what Romans says. It, it, I'm going to paraphrase it. It says, uh, have they not heard? And it says, well, how can they hear unless someone is sent? How can somebody be sent to preach, right? And so people are literally waiting. The lady at the church we, that I spoke at, she came and she said, you know what? Because I told her our transmission had gone out. And she was like, the Lord had your transmission go out so that you and your family could be here. We have never done a mission week. This is our first time. Usually we're on a mission trip, but because of COVID, and she said, I know God brought you here. So I'm angry and upset that my transmission went out, and God is like, will you trust me and let me lead you and guide you? So what's the key? Love. You see, the whole world is waiting. Your whole world, not the whole world, right? Your whole world, my whole world is waiting. You see, then the end shall come. She goes on, the gospel commission is the great missionary what? Charter of Christ's kingdom. The disciples were to work, what's that word? Earnestly for souls, giving to what? All the invitation of what? Mercy. They were not to wait for the people to come to them. They were to go to the people with 
their message. What's the message? You are an inheritance. You have an inheritance. Does that change the, the tone of the way we do uh, evangelism? Instead of telling them that you're in the beast and you're about to get the mark of the beast, and guess what? Your diet is wrong. Your dress is wrong. All that you do. If somebody came to you and told you that, how would you respond? Oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> is that how you would respond? You would be offended. True? True? Everything that you had ever been taught was just condemned in one sermon, <laughs> right? But when we come close to people building what? Bridges and not walls, then we can have that relationship. Last quote. Oh, we got to go here. This is, we got two more, this last text and a quote and we're done. Amen, you still with me? Amen? All right. I try to keep it short. I don't want to wear out the patience of the saints, amen? <laughs> amen, Pastor. <laughs> uh, we're in Luke chapter 12, Luke chapter 12, and we're looking at verse 32 and 34. Luke chapter 12, verse 32 and to 34. It says, well, I'm going to start with verse 31, but rather... Seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to what? To give you the what? Is that an inheritance? <coughs> now notice, he says, sell that you have, give alms, Provide for yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approaches, neither moth corrupteth, for where your what? There will your what? So question, where is my treasure? Where is your inheritance? Where is your inheritance? You can answer. It's in heaven. How many of your loved ones, how many of your neighbors, how many of the people you know you would love to be on that sea of glass with you? Right? Do you have people that you want to be there? Yes, we all have those people. So if we can't do it personally, you know what? Some people won't listen to me. Right? But guess what? I pray and I pray. Send them somebody. Send them an experience, a situation that like this will wake them up. COVID was a wake-up call and put everybody on planet Earth on notice. Whether you're atheist or Adventist, Buddhist or Baptist, guess what? <laughs> Catholic, it doesn't matter. Congregationalist, atheist, agnostic, Everybody on planet Earth knows we are not living in normal times. And people are looking at the handwriting on the wall, and what are they seeing? Want, 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 want. Remember Charlie Brown? They can't interpret it. But do, do you know what's about to happen? Do, do we know? God forbid that we keep our mouths closed. Amen? Last quote, it says, Christ's sacrifice in behalf of man was full and what? The condition of the atonement had been fulfilled. The work for which he had come to this world had been accomplished. He had won the... Let's say it together. He has won the kingdom. He had wrested it from Satan and had become heir, that should be heir, not heirs, heir of the kingdom. It says the work in which he had come to this work. What did he come to do? What was the work in the, the outer court? The work of sacrifice, right? That's what the lamb, did he complete that? So when he said it is finished, he said the work of the, 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 the court is finished. Now he went into where? 
the most holy place in 1844, and he's trying to finish the work, but he needs us to cooperate. So what is our motivation for doing this? If you love me, what? That's the only thing. I learned just a few weeks ago, I was on autopilot. Sometimes in ministry, you can just be on autopilot. Sometimes in your spiritual walk, you just be on autopilot. And sometimes you got to get sick to, to look up, right? <laughs> sometimes you got to have something happen to you to just wake you up and say, hey, your redemption draws nigh. So imagine this. There's a tanker in your community, a, oil, a, a gas tanker, and gasoline is pouring down the streets of all the, just all the drains are full of gasoline. What would you do if you saw that? Hey, everybody, there's gas, thousands of gallons of gas. Hey, 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 you know what? There might be a fire. You might want to leave. Is that how you would do it? What would you do? You would start yelling and screaming, and you would be banging on the doors, open up, open up. There's some, you're in danger, and, and your neighbors might look like at you. It's, it's in the morning. Are you out of your mind? Yes, I'm out of my mind. But guess what? Why are you disturbing their peace? <laughs> to save their lives. Some people are in carnal security. And they do have a do not disturb sign. And we say, okay. But if you know that this could happen, if you know that imminent death was at their door, would you risk them being upset with you? Would you risk it? Absolutely. You see, we're on the very precipice of our inheritance. And there is a great gap. You know, one third of the angels was cast out. God wants to make that up. Did you know that? And he says, please, please hasten my coming. You know, the word of God should never be preached without a response. What is your response today? What is your response today? I don't know what it is. The Holy Spirit has spoken to you, but don't leave this place without making a commitment. Amen? Let us kneel. Oh, great heavenly Father, Lord, I first want to ask you for forgiveness for my own transgressions, my own iniquities, and my own sin. Lord, I have, I have been asleep at the wheel, Lord, and Lord, in your grace, in your mercy, in your love, you have chosen to allow circumstances to wake me up out of my sleep. You said, this is Laodicea. And Lord, we think we're the only Laodiceans. The whole church, the whole Christendom is Laodicea, Lord. All of us are asleep. All of us are slumbering. All of us. But Lord, there's going to be an event that's going to wake the whole church up. Lord, I pray that you would wake us up before that, Lord, before it's too late. And that, Lord, we would have the holy boldness, the tact, and the love. He said, the love of God constrains me. The love of God compels me. Oh, Father. Let us hasten your soon coming. Let us go to the utter ends of the earth proclaiming the inheritance. And Lord, whatever happens after that, we leave it in your hands. Lord, I pray for this little church. Lord, I pray for this community. I pray that, Lord, they will continue the good work that was started here, that they would not be weary in well-doing. And that, Lord, we would not... Uh, compare ourselves amongst ourselves, but Lord, we would do it as unto the Lord. All of us have gifts and talents and abilities. None of us can do everything, but everybody can do something. Lord, we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Let everyone say, amen.